Today I'd like to introduce you to a category of trees and shrubs that gardeners don't usually plant, but they really should use this material more often, and that's viburnum. I'm standing here beside one of my favorite viburnums. I believe it's Mauricii, but I'll confirm that name up above here somewhere. It has this nice layered effect. So the branches come out horizontally, and then the flowers appear on top of them. So you get a really nice display. Now viburnums are mostly white. There are a couple pink ones, but you're dealing mostly with white flowers. They're easy to grow shrubs or trees. In fact, one of my viburnums, I have two plants. I trim one as a shrub and one as a single stem tree. Their growth rate is about medium for a shrub. They have very few pests, but there is one that you should be aware of, and I'll deal with it at the end of this video. But for the most part, insects seem to leave it alone. From a pest perspective, they're a real good choice. They're quite drought tolerant. Most of my viburnums grow out in my shrub garden, and they never get watered. I mean, I'll plant them, maybe water them once. They're lucky maybe twice, and after that, they're on their own. Now, I do mulch around those newly planted shrubs, but they got to take care of themselves. So it's a pretty harsh environment for them, and the viburnums do quite well. It's now the 1st of June, and, and that's a perfect time for viburnums. Now, there are a few that have already finished flowering, and even this one is almost finished. So in zone 5, late May, early June is when you see most of the flowers. But I'm going to take you through the garden and show you a whole bunch of different viburnums. What's very interesting about this one, the white petals that you see here are not really true petals. The plant grows those simply to attract pollinators. The real flowers and the ones that will make the seed are inside. They're very tiny and you can hardly see them. So you do grow the plant for the large white petals. This is very similar to many of the hydrangeas, where the most attractive part of the flower is really not the flower, but these extra special petals that the plant makes. This particular viburnum could very easily be trimmed into a single tree, but right now it's a multi-stemmed shrub. I had a look inside and it's starting to make a few suckers I also noticed that one of the branches layered itself. Because the branches grow horizontally, the very low ones tend to grow along the ground. And one of them got covered with some mulch, I think, and it rooted itself. So I could very easily go down there and cut that off now, and I'd have a new plant. And in fact, I just might do that because you don't find these very often around here. Let's go have a look at some other viburnums. No real fragrance. There's a little something there, but I can't actually say it's pleasant. This is Viburnum trilobum, the high brush cranberry. And it's a native here in Ontario, and I have it growing in several spots in the property. In fact, at times I do have to pull it out because it does self-seed a little bit. It's not bad for that. The flower structure here is very similar to the one we just looked at. Large outside petals but the real flowers are the tiny things in the center. The growth is different. This is a much more upright viburnum, and the flowers are produced at the tips of the stems and face up. You don't have those horizontal branches that we just had a look at. The leaves themselves look just like a little maple leaf, and guess what? It has three lobes on it. That's where the name comes from, trilobum. Most of the viburnums make some interesting berries. This one has very nice red berries that slowly during the winter get darker and darker. It's quite tart, but you can eat it. The birds really don't like it, so it stays on the plant, and the berries are at least as attractive as the flowers. And they're there in the winter time, so it makes a really nice display. What I find that usually towards the end of the winter, when the birds are really hungry and the berries have gotten a little sweeter, then they come in and take them all one day. So it is good food for the wildlife. But unlike many plants, you don't lose the berries right away. You actually enjoy them for many months. You could prune this into a single tree or leave it as a narrow shrub. They do tend to stay fairly small and tall. 
If we have a close look at the leaves here, you'll see some holes in them. The main insect that makes those holes is called the viburnum beetle. And I'll come back to that at the end of the video. In the back of this bed, you'll see a large shrub in the middle. And that's also a high bush cranberry. It was here in that spot when I moved into the property 17 years ago. And I've just let it do its own thing. I've removed the lower branches because they were going to be shaded by my other shrubs. It's not showing a lot of flowers this year, but most years it's just covered in blooms. The shrub in front here that's stealing the show in this picture is an abelia. It's rarely seen in gardens and it's a shrub that should be grown more. Whenever I give it to friends, they just fall in love with this shrub. It's extremely fragrant and it gets covered in pollinators when it's blooming. Here's another one of these pom-pom type viburnums. It's called Stera. At maturity, this shrub will be about 10 feet tall and five to 10 feet wide, depending on how many stems you allow it to grow. Now, even if you plant one of the larger viburnums, you can generally prune them into a smaller shrub. And most of the ones I'm showing you in this video could easily be kept to an eight, 10 foot size shrub. I'd like to tell you about one more viburnum and it's probably one of my favorite. And that's the Korean spice bush, also called the Korean spice viburnum. And the botanical name is Viburnum carlisii. The thing that makes this viburnum so special is the fragrance of the flowers. Now it does flower earlier. In my garden, it's usually mid to late spring. It's hardy in zones four to seven. It will form a six foot shrub. And I've had one where I trimmed it into a standard with a single trunk. Now it's important you don't get this plant confused with some of the other spice bush. So we have Lindera benzoin, which is commonly called spice bush. Then we have the California spice bush, and that's Calicanthus occidentalis. And I grow both of those in my garden as well. But if you're going to grow a spice bush, I think the best one is the Viburnum Korean spice bush. The flowers are great. They give a nice showing, but the real attraction here is the fragrance. The Viburnums are pretty easy to grow. They like sun or part shade. They'll take almost any kind of soil. They don't require a lot of water, but they do have one downside, or at least some of the viburnums have this problem, and that's the viburnum leaf beetle. Now the adults are about a quarter inch long, and they're a yellowish brown color. To be quite honest with you, you hardly ever notice the adults, but the adults will lay eggs on the leaves, and they hatch out as larvae, which are about a third of an inch long. They're yellowish green. They have these black spots and dashes on the body. And when they get larger, they're fairly easy to see on the leaves. But the first thing you'll notice if you have this pest is that your leaves suddenly have a whole bunch of holes in them. Once the beetle hatches out, it lays eggs and the eggs overwinter on the viburnum bush itself. Now the good news about this beetle is that it only affects some viburnum. So we can take all the viburnums and put them into one of three categories. Some are very sensitive to the beetle. I guess they're the tastiest one, so that's where you'll find most of the larvae. And that's where you find most of the damage. And the list you see in front of you are those sensitive shrubs. Then we have the resistant viburnums. And they almost never have the beetle. Their leaves stay nice and clean and you don't see holes in them. And then there's a group of viburnums that are kind of halfway between those two ranges. So sometimes they get some larvae on them. There is some leaf damage, but not very extensive. So the pest really isn't a problem on the last group. So before you buy a viburnum, check to see if you have this beetle locally. If you do, pick one of the more resistant viburnums. And the Korean spice viburnum is one of those. And as I mentioned before, it's probably my favorite viburnum. So that's a good choice. So what do you do if you do get the pest? Well, I have one shrub that gets it quite badly every year. And I just left it alone. The leaves were almost completely gone. But then the larvae have finished growing and they turn into adults. And 
do their thing. And for the rest of the summer, the bush regrew new leaves, which were just fine. So I decided not to treat this shrub and I just left it alone. And I figured, well, this is going to happen for a few years and then the shrub will die. Well, it didn't. It's still there. In the last few years, it doesn't get nearly as many larvae, so only a few leaves are damaged. And that may be the best approach if you have this problem. Now, if you want to tackle the problem, there are some things you can do. So you can spray with horticultural oil prior to bud break. That will kill the eggs that are on the bush. Once the eggs hatch out and you have larvae on the leaves, an insecticidal soap or an insecticidal oil will kill those larvae. So they're fairly easy to control. But my philosophy is just leave them in the garden. If the plant really dies from this problem, then replace it with a better viburnum. So I hope you'll give some viburnums a thought. They're great shrubs, and you really should have one in your garden. Now, if you want to learn more about plants, have a look at my new book, Plant Science for Gardeners. And there'll be a link right here. Happy gardening.